Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone. I think uh, the most natural thing for me to do is to greet you at 8.30 a.m. And uh, <laughs> we'll just adjust to uh, the fact that it's actually 9.30, but it doesn't feel that way. It's great to see you all. Great to gather together. And uh, we look forward to continuing our study in Titus. So let me pray. And we will turn to Titus 2. Our Father, we're just so thankful that you have given us any hour to study your word, that you've given us this hour, that you've given us this place, these people, uh, this church. Father, we're just so thankful to be here in this place on this Lord's Day. And we pray that uh, we'll be faithful students and stewards of your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So... We began looking at this very small New Testament book, and small in terms of its length, certainly not small in terms of its stature. It's also interesting to consider that some of the issues of greatest controversy in the church that come up recurringly and are answered by a passage like Titus actually have kind of erupted in our own midst just in the last several weeks and indeed days. And so just a reminder, is if we needed any reminder of the relevance of God's Word and of the reflex we must have to turn to God's Word for these answers, well, it's right now and kind of right close to us. So, all right, what's going on in Titus when we turn to Titus 2? Now, I just like to remind us from time to time that when Paul wrote Titus, he did not write it with chapters and verses. The chapters and verses were a printer's insertion in the 16th century. Now, by the way, an artifact of the Reformation, because what we're doing right now is important, being able to turn to a specific text. Uh, when the text is being taught, the text is being preached, it helps that the congregation can find the text. Those numbers really help. The uh, printer's name was Robert Stephanos, a Genevan printer. And uh, he was under the preaching of the Reformation there in Geneva, and he grew to love the Word himself, gave his life to the printing of things, and most importantly, the printing of the Word of God. And uh, so he understood the need, and so he worked this out. And basically, it was he who worked this out. Sometimes it works out. <laughs> Other times you wonder, why exactly is that, uh, is that chapter break there? Some of them are, are quite easy, uh, as in the Psalms, or at least the, the Psalms themselves are, are clearly separated. But in a letter, you don't exactly do this except by saying, okay, I think there's a shift here, and uh, so this is going to be chapter 2. Now, it really does help us. It helps us immensely, so much so that it's almost impossible for us to imagine how we could study or preach the Word together if we did not have this uh, mechanism uh, given in the text. And uh, it's just important for us to remember that it is the words of Scripture that are divinely inspired not the chapter and verse divisions. That's a human construct. It's like a printer's mechanism. But it really does help us to even know where we're talking. So I say, Titus 2, verse 1, we know where to find it. There is this chapter break. Why the chapter break here? Well, in what we've seen already in Titus chapter 1, as you know, Titus has been sent by Paul to Crete to clean up a very bad doctrinal confusion. And uh, we have seen that the Apostle Paul minces absolutely no words. So in a way that is not, say, similar to how he would begin his letter to the church of Philippi, the book of Philippians, where Paul just repeatedly talks about how much he loves the congregation, in this case... Paul no doubt loves them, but he's quite concerned about them. And so he tells Titus his assignment, and then we have the opportunity to hear the same letter. As you saw, one of Paul's concerns, even in chapter 1, was right order in the church, verses 5 and following. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you, then follow criteria for the elders. This is something that our forebears, 
had to put their lives on the line for, and, and that's church order. What is rightful church order? Well, the very first thing I think the Apostle Paul would want us to say, the rightful church order, is that there is order. So, if you look through different times in the history of the Christian church, for example, you will see we're on the American frontier. Historians will say that the, uh, the great dynamic in congregationalizing the American frontier was a dynamic between order and ardor. And I think we can see exactly, even on the American frontier, uh, something of the dynamic that you see even here, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries. As the United States was becoming a transcontinental nation, and as people were pressing back on the frontier, and, you know, brothers and sisters, we're at 3rd Avenue Baptist Church in Louisville, Kentucky. I think most people here today have very little impression of the fact that this was the frontier. This was very much the frontier. The Ohio Valley established a very natural marker on the North American continent. And by the way, when the, the Ohio River became so important, no one knew exactly what the North American continent looked like. I, uh, I love old things. I love history. I love historical documents. I love old, old books. I love very old books. I, in my library, have some things I particularly enjoy showing people. And one of the things I enjoy showing people is that uh, years ago, uh, when I was up in the American Northeast, I actually won an auction for an 1836 map of the United States of America. Uh, it's fascinating. Uh, so that's after Lewis and Clark. So it's, it's incredible for how ridiculous it is as a map. They know there was something that was a great salt lake. It's in the wrong place. It's in the wrong state. Uh, they knew that the mountains were roughly from here to there, but in this map that was drawn of North America in the 1830s, they weren't sure exactly what mountain range was where or what. There, there, there are no states in, in this respect, so there are no state boundaries. There are some territories marked out. What's interesting is not how much is known, but how little is known. And the scale is off. Uh, the West is bigger than this map maker indicated it to be, even after Lewis and Clark. And remember, Lewis and Clark started out from right here, which is why right across the river is Clarksville. So this is the frontier. That order versus ardor dynamic was incredibly in play here in Kentucky. And by the way, sprang into the news just in recent days. So order means we're going to do everything according to a structure, a plan, often a sequence. There's a rightful biblical order to things. We, we are a church which epitomizes Protestant order. This is what Protestant order looks like. We do not get up on the Lord's Day and say, who feels like saying something? We do not have spontaneous preaching. We do not follow merely ardor, which means, it's another word for passion. Now, we want passion in our service, right? We want rightly directed passion. The New Testament honors passion, but does not allow passion to rule. Now, this is, a, this is again, one of, the great, one of the great distinctions, even in, say, Protestant Christianity today. You can find churches driven by ardor rather than order right now, right? Right close. You can find churches that say, we're just led by the Spirit. And uh, they would be very frustrated by this. You know, what is this? You are putting chains around the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that dynamic goes on. That dynamic split churches. I think some of you heard me say this before, but I mean, right, right in our neighborhood, massive, massive things going on here. So for instance, in the Campbellite revivals of Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell, Alexander Campbell, the most famous of them, you know, those revivals came through, split the churches in this area. Walnut Street Baptist Church 
was the union, right down the street from us, mother church to this church, Walnut Street Baptist Church was the union of what was left after the devastation of the Campbellite revivals. And I know that sounds very strange. After, after the devastation of the revivals. Well, the revivals just split First Baptist and Second Baptist uh, and, and led to all kinds of things. Right down the street from the seminary, Beargrass Christian Church. It used to be Beargrass long time ago, used to be Beargrass Baptist Church. And so, you know, all that's going on very much. And a part of the criticism of the Baptists is that we were too much committed to order at the expense of a Holy Spirit, you know, freed ardor. Uh, First and Second Baptist, the remnants established a church, and they didn't want to call it First or Second Baptist. And so they named it Walnut Street because they were on Walnut Street. But They're not on Walnut Street anymore. They still call themselves Walnut Street Baptist Church. And there isn't even a Walnut Street anymore. It's Muhammad Ali Boulevard. So church history in Louisville gets very complicated. I said it it kind of sprang into the news with the Asbury development. And, And Asbury, as a campus, was represented by the ardor rather than the order tradition. So that's just interesting. So Asbury and Revival, at least to put the two words together, that is something that goes back to the fact that Asbury kind of came into existence as a college. I often quote the Methodist bishops who said that they chose Wilmore, Kentucky in order to put Asbury 30 miles, all young men going to be there, right? So at that point, it was mostly young men, young women later too. But they wanted to put that college 30 miles from every known form of sin. Kind of good luck with that, but hey, in a state famous for horses and bourbon and all kinds of other things, uh, it's hard to get 30 miles from anything. Uh, Nonetheless, you understand that this revivalism, the Cane Ridge revival, of course, that was so famous, took place here in Kentucky. All this is going on. Baptists are the order people. That's not to say we weren't impacted by, by revival. We weren't praying for revival. But it's an extremely different culture. And so when you look at Asbury, you're looking at an institution that's had repeated, repeated, repeated revivals. And it's it's hard to know. And again, I'm an order person. I'll just uh, tell you right up. You know, make that an initial if I need to. Um, and, And so I believe the Holy Spirit works in the church primarily through the orderly process of worship and church and church order that the Holy Spirit has given. So... So without speaking further about that, I'm simply going to say, I believe that the normal state of the church is to be revived within the order of scriptural worship. That's kind of our commitment. That's why we do what we do and why we don't say, you know, who'd like to say something today? We follow an order of worship, believing this is given to us in the scripture by the Spirit, and thus the Spirit blesses what the Spirit's given. There, that's the definition of order. The Holy Spirit blesses what the Holy Spirit has given. You saw order right here. Um, Biblical word. So here we are. Chapter 2. After all the very strong words of the Apostle Paul against the disorder and the need for order, notice where things begin in chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. I'm just going to stop there, verse 1, for a moment. But as for you, and that means Titus, who has been sent to Crete to reset the church on a far more stable, healthy, gospel, scriptural foundation. But for you, very interesting language here, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, that rings familiar to us, I think. Most of us know this. This is uh, what we think of immediately when we think of the the office of pastor, for example, and the elder described here. It begins with sound doctrine, and we are accustomed to this from the Apostle Paul. Just consider 1 Timothy chapter 1. So hold your finger in Titus, go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And remember, these are the three pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus. There's a commonality. Commonality shows up 
rather remarkably, First Timothy 1, verse 10, To make sense, we better go back to verse 8. Now, we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, the sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the glorious gospel of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. Sound doctrine. So those are two words, and they show up again, sound doctrine. As a matter of fact, the Pauline reflex on this is so strong that uh, it should be pretty clear to us that those two words are a formula, sound doctrine. So sometimes I'll have a conversation with... Uh, person involved in a church, and the word doctrine will come up, and they say, you know, our church isn't, uh, our church isn't big on doctrine. Okay, well, I know what that person probably means, and that's not healthy at all. This is the exact opposite of what the Apostle Paul says. But I also want to think they just don't know what doctrine is, so let's talk about that for a moment. What in the world is doctrine? So I want to give you a, a definition and if I ever suggest you write something down, I do this rarely, I'm going to suggest this. I'm going to suggest you write down a definition of doctrine. And uh, you can paraphrase it however you want, but there are three words that are absolutely crucial. And uh, th this definition of doctrine is not mine. It belongs to a man with one of the greatest names in church history. His name is Yaroslav Pelikan. Okay, Yaroslav Pelican, a phenomenal church historian, was the Sterling Professor of History at Yale University. He wrote a titanic uh, work of significance in the 20th century on the history of Christian doctrine, several volumes. And uh, Yaroslav Pelican, if you're going to write the history of the entire Christian church in terms of a history of doctrine, you better have a definition of doctrine, right? And I'll just tell you, I can't really do better than Yaroslav Pelikan defining doctrine. He said that doctrine is what the church believes, confesses, and teaches on the basis of the Word of God. So the three most important words are, it's what the church believes, confesses, and teaches on the basis of the Word of God. So if we're going to use the word doctrine, we should think about it. And Pelican backed that up with massive study in the Scripture of how exactly the word doctrine is used. And it is used just that way. It is used of believing and confessing and teaching on the basis of the Word of God. So it points to the centrality in the Christian life of belief. And uh, so the church teaches what we must believe, a certain pattern of beliefs, these sound words, these sound words of doctrine. It is right to say it this way. It's wrong to say it another way. And, uh, and so you have in the Scripture itself, as even we've just seen, instructions of what sound doctrine, as in what Christians should believe. All this is made clear. The church must teach what the church must believe. Okay, that's number one. Believes, confesses. That middle word's confesses. Well, how do we confess? Well, we confess in multiple ways. Most importantly, formally in a confession of faith. So throughout the history of the Christian church, and we believe even inside Scripture in certain passages, there are creedal or confessional statements that are summaries or formulas of the faith, and this becomes absolutely necessary. Now, a part of the... We're back to Kentucky a part of the ardor versus order, and the Baptists, certainly Baptists as we understand them, are on the order side, not the ardor side. But those on the ardor side were anti-credalists. So you had the Campbellites, the Campbellite, and, and just this week, in a controversy in the Southern Baptist Convention, you may, that happens sometimes. 
In one of these rare and almost unprecedented controversies in the Southern Baptist Convention, one of the figures arguing against me made the statement, he said, I like that old Baptist you know, motto, no creed but the Bible. Well, you know what that old Baptist creed is? Not a Baptist creed, not a Baptist motto. That was the Campbellite motto, against the Baptists. They were arguing against the Presbyterians and the Baptists and others because the Baptists on the Kentucky frontier and the Baptists who, who founded the churches in Louisville were confessional, creedal Baptists. Well, the creed isn't above Scripture. It's a summary of Scripture. And so that's one of the reasons why in our ordered worship, from time to time, we actually in unison read one of the historic creeds of our tradition together. It could be the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. It could be another statement. It's also why when we have a church congregational meeting, we begin by reading our church covenant, which is in itself also a creedal statement. And so, so all this is very close. What the church believes confesses. And so you look at the history of the confessions. Uh, there could not be, I can tell you this, and... Uh, I won't go into a long argument. I will simply say that I am absolutely beyond the shadow of doubt convinced you cannot have an orthodox theological seminary or Christian school without a confession of faith that is regulative and binding. I believe it is impossible. And if you say, well, it's possible over here, well, it might be possible for a few years, but it will not be possible in the transfer from generation to generation. The creed or the confession doesn't guarantee the succession of faith, but I think the absence of one guarantees the failure of that succession of faith. So, doctrine is what the church believes and confesses and teaches on the basis of the Word of God. So, teaching, that would take preaching, in, in most centrally, the central teaching act of the church. It would also include you know, writing godly books or theological books or making theological arguments. The church teaches on the basis of the Word of God. And, that, and I appreciate the fact that Pelican, who was not an evangelical, uh, but I think he certainly was probably made much more orthodox by having to deal with the creeds and the confessions as the great project of his life. He didn't sound like other professors at Yale, even in that definition. Uh, and it's because... These do not replace the Word of God. As he made very clear, they only operate rightly if they're on the basis of the Word of God. So, two words, sound doctrine. We dealt with the second of them first. With doctrine, what, what does sound mean? Well, without going into a lot of etymology, it's important to consider how else the same language appears. For example, if you say that someone is of sound mind, we mean that they're thinking clearly, right? They're thinking rationally. They're, they're, they're perceiving, they're seeing things aright. If, uh, if they're irrational, if they're making no sense, then they are of unsound mind, all right? If you say, on the other hand, that you have a sound body or you have sound health, that means you're, you're healthy, right? But if, if you're unsound, then you're unhealthy. Something's not working right. Something's not operating right. There's, some, there's something wrong in the body. Now, you could have, you know, in our political and cultural conversation, you have sound government with sound laws. It is a, it is a cumulative word for health. For health. That which corresponds to truth and that which leads to health. So you put those two words together, sound doctrine. It's a reminder of the fact that you have churches that teach aberrant doctrine. They are unsound in their doctrine. And again, you have to go very far down the road and uh, you're looking at churches with unsound doctrine. And of course, the other thing we know from the New Testament is that a church that's unsound in doctrine is going to show up unsound 
in other ways. Its preaching will be unsound. Its understanding of the gospel will be unsound. Its uh, dimensions of ministry will be unsound, and its members will be unsound. Paul begins, first of all, priority. Got to get this right. First of all, he says, I urge... And you'll notice how important this is to Paul. It's first of all, he says to Timothy, to Titus, he says, but as for you. Back to chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you. So that's a contrast, isn't it? So remember how bitter Paul's judgment was on those who were creating all the problems in, in Crete? And remember, he sent Titus to... Uh, to deal with those problems, his apostolic delegate. But he begins writing to Titus, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, this is something really, really important to say to anyone. You're sending a young man out to plant a work, you know, and some elders. We've sent folks out to start new works together. And one of the main charges we would give them is teach the things that accord to sound doctrine. You know, whatever you do, get it started right on the teaching. Or if you arrive in a place and the teaching is not sound, you're going to have to make it sound. And, and again, look at what the Apostle Paul is, but for you, he said to Timothy, but first. It's just important to recognize that if the church is unsound in doctrine, it's going to be unsound in everything. So one of the principles we see from the apostolic teaching here is that you really can't say, okay, I'm going to get the church in order in every way, and then I'm going to get the doctrine right. Well, good luck with that. It's not going to work. And remembers what the church believes, confesses, and teaches. And, and in confessing, by the way, I mentioned creeds, that, that's also what shows up in, in all that, say, is hymnody. You know, what, what, the church, what the church believes, confesses, and teaches in the hymns that are sung. If you're singing aberrant hymns, you're going to have an aberrant theology. If you have aberrant preaching, you're going to have an aberrant doctrine. If, so in other words, this is the priority. And the priority is made clear to Timothy, even with words, it's made clear to Titus with the very first thing after but for you. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. So we spent some time on verse 1 simply because the priority here is so clear. And, and we should not have anything to do with a church that will not abide teaching sound doctrine. Now, that leads to some fascinating questions in the history of the Christian church. Does this mean, and I get these questions sent to me all the time. This is one of the most common questions I have sent to me. And uh, it, it will come with, especially for the Ask Anything segment on the briefing, uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of questions a week now. But there's a common thing in there, and a lot, one of them is, how long should I stay in a church that teaches false doctrine? <laughs> How long should I stay in the bacteria lab? Uh, you know, that's not a quickly answerable statement, right? Because I want to be humble and say, I know where I'm standing right here at Third Avenue Baptist Church. There had to be some folks believing the gospel who even in modern times, had to be willing to abide unsound doctrine until they could arrange for the right doctrine to be preached. It, it, if the only answer is um, you have to leave, well, then you've got to have to have a place to go. Now, again, Baptists, so let's just be clear about something. I was going to go to the Reformation, but just remember that Baptists, we think the Reformers did not take their logic far enough, okay? That's why, that's why we're Baptists, not Lutherans or Presbyterians in the, in the Calvinist Reformation. But in the, in the Reformation, remember that it, let's just date it, again, this is a bit arbitrary, but at least it's real, 1517, Luther nailing his 95 Theses. So let's just say something happened right then in the year 1517, just 500 years ago. And it was not that all of a sudden Christians emerged in the church and said, we've got to leave the Catholic church. It was over a process of a long period of time 
that those who have been working for reformation and calling for the purification of the church and looking for the awakening of the church and for the church to be reestablished upon sound doctrine, it took, you could argue, centuries for the point to be reached in which finally there was the decision there must be a reformation that will have to take place outside of the Catholic Church. So I just want to say in humility, these questions are not always immediately answered by here's exactly the right time. By the way, the answer I give to people when they ask that question is, you should stay in a church no longer when it obstinately refuses reformation by the Word of God. Okay, I don't know that that helps as much as people want. Because you still have to define what obstinate refusal looks like. Because, you know, going to one meeting and losing a vote is not necessarily obstinate refusal. I remind people that in the process of reform, you lose every vote until you win one, then you start winning every vote. It's not always that even, but you get the point. I mean, enough people have hearts to the Scripture, hearts to the Gospel, hearts to the truth, that eventually you go from losing to winning. Okay, but if you don't, that's when you leave. And you say, well, that sounds like, you know, just you're bitter about losing. No, if the church obstinately refuses to reform, and that's, again, where we do have models. The 16th century is a good model for us to think about this, kind of, you know, a, a chaotic model at times, because human beings are chaotic. And the same thing is true if you look at the next century and look at uh, nonconformity in the English Reformation. And that gets close to home because that's where we come from. It's that you eventually reach the conclusion, you know, how did Baptists come to be Baptists? You know, why, 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 are, why, do, why do we separate from the other nonconformists? It is because we gave up trying to convince them to put the baby down in terms of baptism. Um, and so eventually, Baptists began to separate into Baptist churches. I hope I'm making some sense here. The imperative is, we're to teach sound doctrine. You have to work that out. Sometimes, in the white-hot heat of controversy, and, and then you stay, as long as you can, seeking exactly what you have you know, premised here, which is the reform and the cleansing of the church. If, if it will not be reformed according to the Word, then you leave and you start something else. And so... I can remember years ago having a, I was in a debate in Washington, D.C. Those never happen. I was in a, a pu very, very public debate in Washington, D.C. And uh, on, on this issue. And uh, this guy got up and said, well, I, what, what, I, what I, very liberal. And he said, what I think is the great, the great scandal of Christianity is that you Baptists not only have Baptists as separated from Presbyterian and Lutheran and all the rest, you separate from each other. You know, he said, you have, you know, this church here and you have that church right down the street. And uh, for some reason, some doctrinal reason led them to, to start another church. And uh, so anyway, it turned to me, you know, how are you going to handle the scandal of all this? And I just got up and said, look, I want to be a part of a denomination where the truth survives. I want, to be, I want to be part of a, of a, of a Christian movement that uh, is a fellowship of Bible-believing, gospel-loving congregations. And uh, so if necessary, as a Baptist, I have to be willing to leave anything in order to follow the gospel and the Scripture. I said, I also believe that Christ will never be without His church. And so even, you know, we don't have to have anything. We don't have to have a building. We don't have to have a pulpit. We don't have to. All we have to have are believers, wait a minute, rightly ordered by the Word of God. And that means orderly leadership. Okay, so, and by the way, is it a scandal we have so many? Well, sometimes it is. I mean, if you're splitting over something stupid, then yeah. Uh, but you know, you look even in the city of Louisville, most of, the, most of the big historic controversies in Louisville were worth fighting over. And that's just one little microcosm of the Christian church through uh, centuries. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And then immediately we go into fascinating stuff. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. 
okay, I know it's daylight saving time today. You know, it's, uh, it's an hour earlier than the clock says it is. And maybe we're a little confused. But isn't it interesting that we go immediately from, but as for you, teach the things that accord with sound doctrine to. Older men need to be A, B, C, D. You know, oftentimes the question comes, how quickly does doctrine produce consequences? Well, in the Christian church, or in parenting, you know, just think of that context. In, in other words, sound doctrine is behavioral from the beginning. And, and so it's not that it gets behavioral. It is behavioral. And so this is not some kind of dislocation in Paul's thinking because a part of what sound doctrine includes is the order of the church and leadership in the church and the teaching ministry in the church. And so, and that's where the problem is in Crete. So the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, skips not a second jumping from teach the things that accord with sound doctrine to Oh, yeah, now let's start with the problems, older men. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Now, I said the church, and I also said the family. And it is because in the most natural and organic way, those pictures are like a Venn diagram. They overlap. That's why we speak of fathers and mothers in the church. That's, that's why we speak of ancestors in the faith. That's why we speak of, of new believers as, uh, as, as children in the faith. That's why we speak of growing up in the faith. Uh, in a family, a rightly ordered family, you've got a mother, you've got a father. In the rightly ordered family, you've got the father with his role, the mother with her role. In the rightly ordered family, you have children under the discipline and, and under the teaching and the care and the love of parents, and we all know a rightly ordered family when we see one, and we see God's glory in it. Uh, I was in a situation not too long ago, it was, there, was a, there was a really big family. I was preaching in another church, and uh, I was getting ready to preach, and there's this, there was a really big family, lots of kids, and I mean, it was like organ pipes going down, you know. And, uh, and I, you know, how does a right your order family work? Okay, so there's mom and dad sitting on, on the end, and then the kids, you know, it's kind of going down. Okay, so like six-year-old kid. This is just a great thing to watch. Six-year-old kid is getting the six-year-old boy restlessness. Things are getting just slightly out of hand. Okay, so at some point, someone's going to have to do something. Okay, so dad's way down there. Dad appears to be unworried about the entire economy of the situation. <laughs> Turns out dad ne didn't need to be worried about the entire economy of the situation because he's been dadding at this, okay? So no kidding, this is what I watched. I watched like 17-year-old brother reach over and tap 12-year-old brother who looked over at his 6-year-old brother and said, stop. And you look at that and you go, man, that is the rightly ordered family right there. Dad's serene, sitting down there at the end, knowing that the dukes and the earls are going to deal with this. And, uh, you know, he, he, can, he can just kind of regularly sit in the palace because he's ruling over all this. And the and, you know, 17-year-old didn't get up and walk over to the 6-year-old. He taps the 12-year-old. Hey, do your job, 12-year-old. And, and in kind of a big brother way, which was, hey, I'm not yelling at you, but you, if you don't stop this, Bad things are going to happen. And it's just, just, and then things just kind of calm down for a little bit. You know, you look at that and you go, that's just, that's just the way the local church is supposed to work. You know, oddly enough, that's a picture of how the whole church is supposed to work. If dad has to get up and go to the other end of the pew, you know, something's wrong in this economy. Something's wrong in this order. But it starts with older men. And so, look, <laughs> Uh, I have looked in the mirror. I know where I stand here. <laughs> you know, when I was elected president of Southern 30 years ago, they said, you know, youngest seminary president. Oddly enough, no one says that anymore. 
you know, at, at some point they just stopped saying that entirely. Uh, there's a distinction between not only men and women. Paul gives us a distinction between older men and, and later younger men and older women and younger women. Now, there is no way we're going to deal with all of this today, so we're just going to talk about it as the conception of what's going to come when we are together next week. So, the distinction between, by the way, the distinction between older men and younger men is separated in the text. I don't know why. The distinction between older women and younger women are together in the text. So, effectively, have Older men, older women, younger women, younger men. Is there an importance to that? I don't know. It could just be an interesting part of how the Apostle Paul is thinking. But he starts with older men, and, and the word he uses here is the cognate to the word elder. So it reminds us that the word elder is used two ways in the Christian life. Can we just distinguish those two ways? One of them is kind of like when anyone talks about family elders or tribal elders, okay? So how do you become an elder in that category? You don't die. You know, you live long enough to have white hair, a beard, you know, and all, all the rest. And, and, and so there is some authority and some respect that comes just from being old and showing up. That's a, that's a part of it. But that's not all there is to it because in the Christian church, that does not qualify you singularly to be an elder in, in terms of pres, presbyteros, uh, but it, it does indicate that there is something to the distinction between older men and younger men, even without reference to office. There's just something there. And that's one of the reasons why it's a sign of health when you come into a church and there are older men and younger men and older women and younger women. That is a sign of health. You know, if you go and come into a church and everybody's young, well, frankly, I think all of us rejoice in young people loving the Lord. That's, that's exciting. The absence of young people is devastating. That's liberal Protestantism. They have no young people. And I think I talked on the briefing about this just a couple weeks ago. It's because I was reading a book um, written by liberals for liberals, and the main theme was, we went liberal to gain young people. Where are they? You know, they, they, they went liberal following the argument, if you don't change your doctrine, you're not going to have a young people. We change our doctrine, and all the young people are in the conservative churches. They lied to us. Uh, so the absence of young people is devastating. But you know, the absence of old people is also older people. Let me be careful. The absence, it's, it's like the new demographic category, no kidding, that U.S. Census is considering with the category of the extremely old. And it's an achievement of health that we have people, you know, a significant number of people who are in the, evidently, this newly con conditioned you know, extremely old category. So this is say, this is uh, older. I like that. Let's just make it older. The distinction between older men and younger men, there's a responsibility given to each. And, and, and there's a gift given to each. And so time's running out here. But uh, what we're going to see is that uh, on the male side of this equation, and this is very clearly a distinction between men and women, that's basic, and then a distinction between older and younger within both categories, he starts writing to older men who bear the primary responsibility uh, in, the, in, the, in the entire equation and speaking to that group within the church, Titus is to encourage them towards four moral categories. They are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. So you can count it as you want, but something like four to six imperatives, and it's, it looks like the last ones are conditions of number four. But the point is, and by the way, we'll look at this next week in more detail. It, it, there, there's some translations will just say sober. 
And so you might think, well, that means not drunk. Well, it certainly includes that, but it seems to have a far greater meaning, and that's why I think most of the best translations have something like sober-minded, rational, careful, deliberative, and then dignified. Isn't it interesting that that's actually a word that is given to older men? We'll see this next week. There's a dignity that older men are supposed to possess. And uh, lacking that dignity, older men are goofy. There is actually a dignity. And what we're going to talk about next week is how in various ages men have learned how to cultivate that dignity. And we're seeing in our own age a loss of that dignity. And I think at expense to the culture and, and to the church. So much more here. And uh, so when we're together next, we'll turn to look at what it means to be a man or a woman in the church, what right order looks like, and then the distinction between older and younger in both categories. And isn't it kind that the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, has so honestly and directly spoken to these things? I think we would want to say yes. So let's pray. Father, we're just thankful you gave us all of this. And Father, we pray to be found in right order, in sound doctrine, teaching the things and demanding, hungry for, eagerly receiving the teaching of the things that accord with sound doctrine. Father, we thank you for your work in this church to bring about sound doctrine. And we pray to receive it gratefully and to confess it eagerly uh, and to perpetuate it for the generations yet to come. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.